Turn with me, if you would, to the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter eight. This morning, God being our, our helper, I would like to talk about principalities and powers. And I think that that is demonstrated amply in this most wonderful set of scripture. Beginning at verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. As I continue to read along this section, we're talking about those that God elected and chose and saved. I trust that I'm speaking to a few of them today. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So in these few short verses, we find Paul, by the Spirit of God, is telling us the great plan of salvation that has been accomplished through Jesus Christ. These that God loved, these that were called according to his purpose, God predestined, predestinated, which means he determined their, uh, their eventual um, destiny beforehand. He predestined them, and he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son, that is Jesus Christ. Christ, all of God's people who were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, these whom Christ came and died for and obtained their salvation, he has now uh, called them and justified them and glorified them so that we stand indeed as the heirs of God and the joint heirs of Jesus Christ. This is remarkable. This is, I, I don't say unbelievable, but it's amazing to consider the grace of God and it's all done according to his purpose. Not his purpose and a little bit of your purpose. Not his purpose if you're willing, but his purpose. And it says God's people will be willing in the day of his power. God makes us fit for heaven. And it's all him. And this is glorious. But let's continue reading because what Paul is thinking about are, <coughs> excuse me, our objections to this or he wants to make sure that his readers, who in, in the short term were the people in Rome, but largely, you know, more, more broadly to all of God's people throughout the gospel age, he says, what then shall we say to these things? What's the significance of this? Think about how great it is that God has elevated us to such a high degree to be identified with Jesus Christ, to be glorified with him and through him. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can oppose the work of Almighty God? Who can stand against us? He's not saying that there won't be beings that do. He's not saying that Satan's not going to accuse, but he says they have no case. If God be for us, who can be against us? And I want to say that to each one of you. If God is for you, then who can stand against you? You're going to have problems. You're going to have troubles. You're going to have issues. You're going to have doubts. You're going to go through problems. But remember this, beloved. If God be for you, who can be against you? The answer is no one and nothing. And that's what he continues to talk about. He says, he that spared not his own son, that's speaking of Jesus Christ, but delivered him up for us all, that is to the cross, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The, 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 the sacrifice and the death of Jesus Christ was not the end of God's love toward us. It was the beginning. Okay, Because not only did Jesus Christ die on our behalf, satisfying the wrath of God so that there are no charges to be brought against us before the holy throne of God, but God raised him from the dead. And as the first fruits, we will likewise be raised in honor and glory at the second coming, right? And not only that, but he says God has ascended. Jesus Christ has ascended to the right hand of God. We will ascend as well. These things that Jesus Christ has done, 
they've been given to us all. Shall he not freely give us all things? And that even includes the smallest things that you stand in need of. He will give you those things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. I think that the Apostle Paul, as he's reading through this one, obviously he's, as he's thinking of who is it that might make a claim against any of God's elect, that is his chosen ones, these same ones that were loved, these same ones that were predestined, these same ones that were called, these same ones that were justified, these same ones that have been glorified, these same ones that have been elevated to be with Christ. He says, who's going to lay a charge against them? Now, that's not to say there won't be accusations by Satan and others, okay? But who can make such a charge stick? He says, no one. It is God himself that justifies. You need to understand the grace of God that is being displayed here. It's amazing. We sing about amazing grace, but I don't think we really understand how amazing it is, the grace of God that has been given to all of God's elect. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Should there be a charge made against you, Jesus Christ himself, as our great advocate, stands ready to say, no, with my own blood, I have paid for this. It reminds me of of um, a, a, a similar scene that we see in the book of Zechariah where uh, Joshua the high priest is standing there in filthy clothes and, and Satan is accusing him and God stands forth and says, let him alone because I have chosen Jerusalem. I have chosen him. That's the basis for our salvation. That's the basis for our justification because it is God that justifies. It is Jesus Christ who not only died but raised again and has been set in heavenly places and stands for us. This is important background to what we're going to talk about. But don't you agree that this is glorious? Amen. And this is true. Okay? It might not be believed in the world. And there might, you know, the world might put an asterisk against that and say, yeah, all of this is good, but you've got to do your part. No, God does his part. And this is his part, saving you. And now we rejoice in him. There is something for you to do, but it's not to gain heaven. Jesus Christ is the one who puts us into heaven. Okay? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the other question that we have. Jesus Christ has done all of this. Is there any way that we can fall short? No, of course not. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And Paul begins to, to enumerate some things that may make us sometimes feel like we have been separated from the love of Christ. Have you ever felt that way? Like, where is God? You know, I, may, am I even one of his? You know, we, we all go through that experience. But notice what he's saying. Shall tribulation, Right? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, shall any of these things separate us from the power of Christ and the love of Jesus Christ toward his children? No. He says, no, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. No, the Christian life is not one of defeat. It's one of of victory, but it's not a victorious life that the world would count victorious. Uh, we go through problems, we go through sorrows. We it's as if as if we were sheep being led to the slaughter. But what you ought to understand from a spiritual perspective, we are more than conquerors because our conquering King, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Captain of our salvation, goes before us and guides us and protects us, and we will never ever be separated from His love. And this, these are the verses that I want you to consider also. For I am persuaded, this is something that Paul believed, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can separate us. And notice he says life or death or principalities or powers, right? Things present, things to come, the future, the past, the present, things that happen, death, height, any other creature, nothing, nothing can thwart God's plan of salvation. Nothing can thwart 
your salvation that God has given you in Christ Jesus. And if you're a believer, that's not the cause of your eternal salvation, but it is the evidence of it. Okay? That's what he's telling us. So I said all of that to say this, <laughs> to, to quote um, uh, our beloved brother, uh, Joe Hayes. He said, I said all of that to say this. <laughs> Among all the things that, that Paul is, is saying here, he identifies principalities, and powers. And you might kind of wonder, what are those things? I'm here to tell you the Bible explains it to us, and that's what I would like to talk to you about. Okay, Because the Bible makes it clear that there are spiritual beings. There are spiritual rulers. There is a spiritual realm, and it's not. this is not information that's just of, an, of, of interest to us. It's fundamental that we understand this. Angels, okay, beings, Elohim, as they're called in the Hebrew. Let's go to let's go to Ephesians chapter three. There's another location where Paul, in passing, makes reference to this. God has elevated Jesus Christ above every name. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, of all in heaven and all in earth. All power has been given to Jesus Christ. We need to understand how great our Savior is. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is talking about the the mystery of Christ that is revealed to us through the gospel. And just picking up the thought in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 3, he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints... Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now that might be difficult to understand. That verse 10, it might be difficult to parse what he's saying. Uh, It's correct. What he's saying is, is that God is showing favor to the church, which is the assembly of God. And I I think in this sense, he's not talking about a local body of believers, but the, the church universal, all of God's elect, the same people we were talking about in Romans 8, okay? God is showing his wisdom by his dealings with us, by his salvation, by his glorious grace to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. God is demonstrating to the angels his glory. Your life matters. Your life is on display. Okay. What do we read in some other places? We read in the book of Peter, for example, where he talks about how the holy men of old, when they were moved by the Spirit of God to write these prophecies of this mystery, which the people in the Old Testament did not understand this full weight of salvation that was revealed when Jesus Christ came, that's revealed by the gospel, and they would themselves study their own writings, to try to understand what it is that God has planned. But notice, it doesn't just limit it to the holy men of old, the old prophets, but also the angels themselves desired to look into these things. Isn't that interesting? Whatever our conception of Jesus Christ, whatever our belief on Him, it's not high enough. And that's the point that the Bible makes. We just concluded a study Uh, over the last several months of the book of Revelation. And I want to encourage you, even though we're now moving on in our our Wednesday night Bible discussions, we're going to go on and go start looking at some other Old Testament prophecy. It's the same message. Same message that Jesus Christ has come. He's been victorious. He's going to put down his enemies and he's going to elevate his people to live with him forever. That's the consistent message through all of the Bible. But have you ever thought about how many angels there are? In the book of Revelation, I mean, if you just kind of in your mind, you kind of think back to all the different angels. They're just everywhere, and they all are doing things, right? You know, there's an angel in chapter 8 that takes the coals off of the the brazen altar in heaven. Yes, there's a brazen altar in heaven. Yes, there really is. And he casts them to the earth. 
We find that there are seven angels that are given trumpets, and as, as each trumpet is sounded, there's a great judgment upon the wicked of this earth. We find a great, ju- a great angel who comes down, and he looks like a mighty angel, and we're not sure exactly what all this uh, signifies, but he stands with one foot on the earth and, on the, and another on the sea, and he makes certain proclamations, and there's another angel that has the seven vials of judgment that are to be poured out upon the wicked at the very end, upon the seed of the beast's power. And he gives those to seven other angels. There's another mighty angel in chapter 20 that binds Satan and throws him in the, in the pit. And can you see there's, there's angels, th- these exist. Now the Bible is not about angels. And the Bible comes with it a great warning that we do not think about them too much. We certainly do not worship them. Okay? And I want to make that clear, but all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All of it. Okay? Paul said, I, would, I, I, was, I, I would, was not negligent to teach unto you or deliver unto you the whole counsel of God. And if there's something in the Bible, we need to study it, we need to understand it, and we need to believe it. And that's one of the things that we see. The book of Hebrews tells us that angels are ministering spirits sent right, to minister unto those who are the heirs of salvation. In another place, he says, do you not know that ye shall judge angels? So this is a class of beings that exist. And here, what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 3 is that just, oh, by the way, just so you'll know, God is teaching or showing to these principalities and powers his manifold wisdom through his dealing with these uh, little ones, these, these little ones, right, who fell. The Bible tells us about a great adversary. His name is Satan. If you study the scriptures carefully, it appears to me that he was once a great mighty angel. He was a class, I don't know if he was an archangel, I don't know if he was a seraphim or a cherubim or whatever, we don't know about that. We do know that from the very beginning we find him, though, as the accuser of the brethren. If, if, if the uh, Isaiah 28 and and Ezekiel 14 and other places are talking about Satan, which I believe that they are, then he clearly fell from a place of great honor and glory. And part of that might have been pride. Part of that might have been um, jealousy. Part of it might have been the fact that that he was offended, being the greatest creation of God uh, in this heavenly realm, that God would show favor to man and elevate him and create him in his own image. We don't know, but the Bible does tell us clearly that he exists because he's a roaring, he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's it's strange for us to consider what the Bible has to say about these things because if you look at Psalms 82, Psalms 82 is a psalm of Asaph, the first verse is very peculiar. Psalm 82 and 1 says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Among the gods. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the The gods. Now, this is a very interesting thing because if you look at the Hebrew, obviously we have the King James uh, translation in English, and we don't need to go beyond that, but I do want you to see that in the Hebrew, the word God, big G, God, and the word gods, little g, gods, are both the same word in the Hebrew. That same word is Elohim. Okay? Elohim. And Elohim is a word that basically means a ruler, someone with authority and power in the spiritual realm. Now, let me be very clear that the Bible is very, very clear in the scriptures that most of the time the word Elohim refers to the God, the God of gods, the creator God, and he and only he is to be worshiped. But here and other places, it shows that there are spiritual beings, some of whom wish to be worshiped, you see the significance of this? You see where this is going? Okay, like Satan and others. Elohim is a broad term that can mean a ruler. It can mean in the New Testament, it can mean a principality or power. Because that's who Paul is talking about. What this shows us is, is that God is the ruler, not just over the earth, but also in heaven. And there is a divine council, as it were. There are beings, some are good, some are bad. 
but these are these which deal with the affairs of this world. You might look around and say, why is the world so crazy? Well, part of it is the sin of man. Part of it is the fall of man. There's no doubt, but there's more to it than that. There are wicked, evil powers that are seeking to thwart the will of God and the purposes of God. And there are good powers, there are good Elohim, as the scriptures teach us, that oppose that, that do God's will. There is, in other words, spiritual warfare going on. And isn't that what Paul says in, um, is, it, is it Ephesians chapter 6? Is it Ephesians chapter 6? He mentions the principalities and powers. That's kind of strange, isn't it? Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, these are beings that you leave alone. Let's make it absolutely clear. I'm not teaching doctrines of angels. One of the problems, especially the, the Colossian church had, was they would actually worship angels. Where do you think all these gods in the Old Testament came from? Baal and Moloch and Ashtaroth. These are real beings. Dagon. I know they set them up as, as idols. There were manifestations of them in the form of rock and stone and, and wood and so on. But these beings behind them were real. And God is the Lord of them all. He has conquered them. Okay, You need to understand that. But that doesn't mean that they're not still up to mischief. And that's what the Bible teaches us. Now, you might say, well, Randy, this is kind of weird. When I look at Psalm 82, God standeth in the assembly of the Elohim. He stands in the assembly of the angels. But the Bible tells us plainly that that's exactly what happens. I made an allusion earlier to the book of Job. Y'all remember the book of Job? Okay. First, the oldest book in the Bible? What do we read about going on in the book of Job at the very beginning of this book? Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, the Elohim, the sons of El, the Ben El, Ben Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. There is a spiritual realm. Okay? And here in the book of Job, as we read about this, it may seem kind of harsh. It may seem kind of unfair. Nothing God ever does is unjust. We might not understand it. But here Satan brings an accusation against Job that, in essence, what, what Satan says is, here's a man that, yeah, sure, he serves you, but he only serves you because of all of the blessings that you've given us. The wager, the, 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 the charge that, that Satan makes is, if you take everything from Job, he will curse you. He will curse you to your face. That's what he's saying to God. And of course, you know that Satan lost that wager. Because Job, all the things that he went through, and now he did go through some very great, horrible uh, time. You know, he lost his children and he lost all of his possessions. He was afflicted. It wasn't over just like that. It was a long time. It was very difficult. Job did become self-righteous. He did get to the point where he felt like God owed him an explanation, but that's not the same as him denying God and cursing him. In fact, he tells his wife, you sound like a foolish woman. I'm not going to curse God, right? I, I don't understand what he's doing. In, in chapter nine, he says, I know there's a way that, that man can be just before God, but I can't see it. He could see it by faith. He could understand that God was going to have to send down someone to bridge this gap. And that's what the revelation of Jesus Christ is, that he's the one, he's the days man who stands between God and man and, and links us together and makes us right with God. Job understood that. But notice, don't, don't pass by the clear teaching that there's a council of angels. Some are on the right hand and some are on the left. And God rules over them, just as he says. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And the reason this is significant is, is that, once again, there are fellow servants. They, uh, they worship God. In the book of Revelation, John falls down to worship one. He says, get up. Don't, don't worship me. Worship God. Okay? Right? 
You don't pray to them. You don't get involved with them. You don't talk to them. You don't seek them out. You seek God. But you do need to know that they exist. Okay? And that's part of the spiritual warfare. And there are some that are wicked and they stand opposed to God. And when you look out at the world and all the craziness, no one can solve it. We can't just, it's not just a question of, well, if we'll just elect the right ruler, the right earthly ruler, okay? We can solve all this. That's, that's nonsense. If anything ought to teach you, if you read the Bible and you read and you pay attention to your experience and you live long enough and you think about this, you ought to understand this is a spiritual battle. This whole world is consumed with spiritual wickedness and there's all sorts of fighting going on. But there's someone coming. That's the promise of the gospel. There's someone coming who's going to fix it. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And until he comes, he will give us the grace to do our job. It's not your job to go fix what's going on in the Middle East. It's not your job to go fix what's going on in Washington. But it is your job to remain faithful follower of Jesus Christ and to encourage others to be light in this world. That's more than enough to keep you occupied. Okay, So don't let the world get you all mixed up because that's what they want you to do. Trust God and follow Him. But understand that God is the one who rules both the councils of heaven and on earth. And if you don't understand what's going on right now, that's why He gave you faith. Okay, Just, just trust Him and follow Him. Now there's a couple of other points that I'd like to make. In, in 1 Kings 22, I find a very interesting uh, event that is recorded for us in the days of Ahab, and there's a prophet named Micaiah. I've always enjoyed this, although it's troubling to me to a, to a degree. Uh, this is at the days of a man named Ahab, and he was a very wicked man. He was a king of Israel. And he was the worst ruler, the worst king that Ahab ever had. And his wife was Jezebel, all right? And she was a Phoenician. She was a, she was a worshiper of, of Baal and Ashtaroth and all of these wicked rulers, okay? And that infected the nation of Israel. And Ahab lived for a long time. You might know, say, well, why didn't God just smoke Ahab when he was early? Why didn't he send a lightning bolt and destroy him? He would have gotten rid of it. And the, the answer to that is because there's no end to the wickedness in this world, Okay? Because our enemies are immortal. Okay? These principalities and power in spiritually heavenly high places, they keep going until God tosses them in the lake of fire. So what we got to do is just trust God and know that his counsel is right. And if a wicked man is allowed to live for a long time, that's, that's God's business, not ours. And it's not your place to go take them out. Okay? That's, that's another important part of understanding what the Bible has to say about this. Because remember, the principalities and powers are among the things that cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Okay? They have no power here. Okay? You trust God. You serve Jesus Christ. You follow Him and wherever He leads you. And you don't worry about this is going on. But don't deny it either because there's great deception coming. These beings are going to reveal themselves, I believe. I think they're going to show up and pretend to be space aliens and everything else. And everybody's going to be deceived. But you're not going to be deceived because you're reading the Scriptures and you know this is coming. This is real. But anyway, what I like in 1 Kings 22 is that Ahab wants to go and take back a city that is in the possession of the king of Syria. Uh, I think it's called Ramath Gilead. It's a treasure city on the east side of the, of the river Jordan. And I think that under previous dealings, the king of Syria had promised to give it back to uh, Ahab, King Ahab. And now King Ahab's all angry. So he wants to go to war to take control of this city. And there's the king of Judah, whose name is Jehoshaphat. And he was a very good man, although he was very naive. I, I believe me, I understand uh, Jehoshaphat. I've been a lot like Jehoshaphat in my life. I want everybody to get along, and I want everybody to be great. And, and Jehoshaphat says, sure, my people are your people. My chariots are your chariots. Sure, we'll go to war. Uh, that's foolish. In fact, Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, got into trouble with God because he wanted to make an alliance with Ahab. He wanted to get along in the world. Okay? Now, you got to do what you got to do, all right? We've got to honor Jesus Christ. But you do not compromise your principles, and you certainly don't marry off your daughter to his son to try to unite the kingdoms and do things that are contrary to God. You'll get called out by God, as Jehoshaphat did. But here, Jehoshaphat at least had the good sense to say, okay, king, before we go to war... Don't you think we maybe ought to inquire of the Lord? And Jehoshaphat said, that's, I mean, and Ahab said, that's a good idea. So he brought out 400 of his 
uh, his own prophets that worked for him, and they always told the king exactly what he wanted to hear. That sounds familiar. This, is, this Bible's a whole lot more contemporary than you realize. Okay, this, this, this kind of stuff goes on today. So King Ahab, who's the wicked king, he brings out 400 men who purport to be true prophets of God. They're going to say exactly what it is that God has told us to do. And what they say is that God has said that you should go and take this city and be successful. And you should go and it'll be great. And Jehoshaphat at least has this good sense. He says, you got any other prophets that we could talk to? <laughs> you know, maybe maybe a, you got a real prophet because he could see through the, the foolishness. And um, what happened says the king said, well, there is, there is this one guy. There is this guy named uh, Micaiah. The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. It can't be that bad. Right? Isn't that funny? Though? How many people are like that? How many of our rulers are like that? Oh, they want to put on the, the cloak and say, yeah, we're, we're followers of God and all of that, but they want to hear what they want to hear. Don't be deceived. The God of heaven, the creator God, the Elohim singular, the true and living God, he is the one who's in control of all powers on heaven and on earth. And you don't need to let that get you down. Obviously, it wasn't any fun being in the land with, with an evil ruler such as Ahab, but that's, that's the way it is. You're called to live this life faithfully to God because your home is not here. Your home is there. And God will safely get you there. Until then, he will give you the grace to put up with foolishness like this. So anyway, they call this man named Micaiah. And one of the men who's bringing him in says, you know, you ought to go easy on yourself. Why don't you just tell the king what he wants to hear? He's going to do whatever he does anyway. Just, just tell the king what he's good. No doubt the man who was talking to Micaiah meant well. But, but Micaiah said, I'm not having any of that. He was a pretty crusty fellow. Kind of people that we ought to be. All right. What um, Micaiah said was that, this, well, verse 13 says, The messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophet declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. But then Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And that's how we ought to be. That's really how we ought to be. We ought to care less about what other people think of us. We ought to care less about uh, how, how we're going to be perceived. Obviously, we ought to be, our, our words ought to be filled, seasoned with grace and with love and kindness. But at the end of the day, we ought to speak the truth in love and just let the chips fall where they may be. You might be surprised if we were to truly be that kind of bold in our lives, what good things God might do on, on our behalf, right? Okay, What we're afraid of sometimes are things we shouldn't be afraid of. We should always speak the truth, as Micaiah said he would. And the reason I say that is that this is interesting, because he now appears before King Jehoshaphat and King Ahab, and Ahab says, should I go? And Micaiah begins by mocking him and says, yep, you ought to go. And he says, I told you, tell me the truth. And this is the verses I want you to see. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me? Uh, but evil, because what Jehoshaphat, what what uh, the king, what what the prophet said was, if you go to battle, you will be killed. Okay, I saw all of Israel sh scattered. That's the prophecy, and that's by the way, that's the truth. What's going to happen? Ahab's about to go and die. God has decreed it. It's going to happen. He's going to die in battle because of all of his wickedness. And Micaiah says, "Yeah, you go, king, and you're going to die. You're not coming back." But then Micaiah says this curious thing. And remember, Micaiah said, I'm only going to speak the things that God told us to say. And he said unto me, verse 19, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. This is the prophet Micaiah speaking. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramath Gilead. And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. <coughs> and there came forth a spirit 
and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith or how? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he that is the Lord said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now you might take the position that, well, this is just a metaphor. This is just, you know, this is just Micaiah just saying stuff. No, that's not true at all. This really happened. Micaiah said, I'm only going to speak the things that God had me say. And what we see in this vision is God here is standing before all of the, all of the Elohim, all of the principalities and powers. And he actually proposes, who will go forth and cause Ahab to go to his death and an evil spirit? Now, I might give you a little bit of pause, and I'm not saying it's necessarily this way now. This is the Old Testament, but I do want you to see that this is what the Bible tells us. God is the ruler over all. He's not the author of sin, but he uses even wicked men sometimes to carry out his purposes. That's what he told the prophet Habakkuk, right? I'm going to use the Chaldeans. I'm going to use the Babylonians to punish my people, and then I'm going to bring in the Persians to punish them. God is the one who's in control, okay? And you need to realize that. And these principalities and powers have power in this world. And of course, you know the story um, that, that that was uh, Micaiah's point. He said, look, all your prophets, these 400 prophets over here, are, have been infected by a lying spirit to make you go to your death. And Ahab is just filled with rage. Because, and he says, go put him in prison and afflict him. And when I get back, we're going to deal with you. I'm going to, you know, the implication is we're going to have a barbecue and you're the main course. We're going to I'm going to kill you when I get back. And Micaiah says, King, if you come back at all, I've not spoken of the Lord, but you're not coming back. Okay? This is the power of God. And you know the story Ahab was at least cautious enough that he disguised himself as a normal infantryman and he had Jehoshaphat, this gullible oaf of a guy, to dress up and pretend to be him. And we know they went out to battle and um, they were all standing around and a man at a venture fires an arrow, just one of the guys out of frustration, he just fires an arrow into the air, and it hits Ahab, and Ahab dies, okay? That's the story, okay? And this is who we're dealing with. This is the same presentation that we have of God, both in the Old Testament and the New. He is the Lord of heaven and of earth. He has subjected all of these powers, okay? And he has subjected us, okay? And we ought to be willing followers of him. There's a, there's a whole lot more places, obviously, that we could go to, but there's one more place that I, that I want to go to, and that is in uh, Colossians chapter 2. Okay, Colossians chapter 2. Again, speaking of the great, mighty power of Jesus Christ. Um, Let's just begin at verse 6, and then we'll read down through about verse uh, 19 or so. Paul, writing to the Colossians, says this, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, that is in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye, that is his believers, his followers, his children, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He's not talking about physical circumcision. He's talking about spiritual circumcision. God has cut away the fleshly part of your heart and made you alive in him. That's what he's talking about. Buried with him, buried with Jesus Christ in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, talking about these Gentiles, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The reason that Paul could write so confidently that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ, there is none who can bring charge, is because that debt has been paid in full and it's been nailed to the cross. That debt has been canceled. You are right with God because God has made you right with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And there is nothing else to do other than our just love to him, just walking with him in fellowship and in love. And that's what we're called to do. Look at the next verse. Okay, So talking about the, the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I hope you understand that. He's not talking about the Romans. And he's not talking about the Sanhedrin. He's talking about the principalities and powers. He's talking about all of these who stood before him. He has spoiled them. He has taken control. He is the Lord of all. All authority is given him. All power is given him in heaven and in earth. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of a new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Two more verses. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, including intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment rent ministered and knit together increase with the increase of God. What he's saying is, is that just like today, just like in these days, there are people today, you may not be aware of them, but you're going to be, that are going to say that the Elohim in the Bible were a bunch of space aliens who visited us years ago, an uplifted man, and they're coming back. Okay. What they fail to see is that that is true in part. There have been angels that have sinned. No question that's true. Jude tells us that. But the Elohim singular, the creator God, is the one who created this world. And anything contrary to that is a lie. And so we need to understand that the scriptures are teaching us that Jesus Christ has subjected them all. He's the one we serve. He's the one we worship. He is the one who has taken control of all of these others. And someday... He is going to come and bring judgment upon them and usher in that eternal day, new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I thank you for your kind attention. There's many more things that could be said. Perhaps they will be in the future, but I hope that you will consider these things because they are in the word of God. God bless you.